So, a quick little blurb before the actual analysis begins. I will not delve into a summary or plot review of Stone Ocean, since this analysis is for those who have already read or watched the part and have an understanding of it. I highly recommend going ahead and experiencing Stone Ocean before watching this, as this video will contain spoilers. It would also be appreciated if comments were made after watching this video fully. Part 6 is my favorite piece of media ever, and I don't want to read any comments from people trying to have, you know, a gotcha moment by explaining something that I've studied for years, performed scholarship on, and have a lot of love for. There's nothing more insulting and aggravating than being a woman obsessed with JoJo's and facing people at conventions and in online spaces asking me if I've read Stone Ocean while I'm cosplaying as Jolene or trying to explain the plot or characters to me as if I've not been researching this part for years. Furthermore, if you're an Anasui hater, this is not a safe space for you. He's my pookie bear and my all-time favorite character, with a segment of this analysis dedicated entirely to him and his importance. So if you're planning to argue about a character that I've, again, dedicated time and endless studies to, pack it up, ant with bindle style, you're out of here. So please, please, please don't be that person. This video is meant to share my ardent adoration for Stone Ocean and my reverence for the creativity behind it. Now. Without further ado, this is a dissection of Hirohiko Araki's Stone Ocean, reflecting on Japanese aesthetic principles. Araki Hirohiko, renowned mangaka, has been writing subversive manga since 1987, with the release of the record-smashing series Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. While the best-selling series has been notable for decades due to its nuanced take on gender, its sixth installment, Stone Ocean, was revolutionary. Published from 1999 to 2003, Stone Ocean, frequently referred to as Part 6, Stotion, or SO, which I'll use interchangeably throughout this video, not only marked a genre shift for the franchise, but was also a direct response to and deliberate subversion of Japanese aesthetic principles and values. Araki's genius and in intentional writing and stylistic choices served to elevate the art and story of Stone Ocean while establishing his own values. As defined by Donald Keane in The Pleasures of Japanese Literature, the four principles of Japanese aesthetics are simplicity, suggestion, irregularity, and perishability. Simplicity can be seen in the intentionally austere gardens and art associated with Japan, having spawned a number of counterculture movements such as Gyaru that reject minimalism and muted aesthetics. Suggestion is rooted in implied actions, such as Keane's given example of branches about to blossom. It is an aesthetic of potential and subtlety. Imperfections and incompleteness are the foundation of the aesthetic of irregularity, which leads to the impermanence represented by the concept of perishability. Keane suggested these to be the core preferences of Japanese culture and its aesthetics. With these definitions for the four Japanese aesthetic principles, it's easier to grasp how Araki's work with part six was so subversive. This part is greatly defined by its setting. Although Araki had already a history of working with vibrant colors and designs reminiscent of high fashions and stylish musicians, he leaned fully into a Miami Vice aesthetic to capture the atmosphere of Florida and its residents. Another key aspect of this part is its roots in Western feminist aesthetics at the time of its publishing, as Jolene was the first and so far only female protagonist of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Everything about Stone Ocean was done to break away from the expectations set for the franchise. It acts as part of a second trilogy in the series, ending the first universe in timeline. It's perhaps the most important installment in the series for this reason. By subverting expectations and tropes within the genre and the series, Araki was able to tell a deeper story with his art and officially end a manga arc that had been running for nearly two decades. In Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, stands are physical manifestations of a person's will. It is a realization of irregularity. Those with unusually strong wills and backgrounds are made stronger and more whole by the tangible presence of their tenacity. There is a running joke that stand users often look irregular as well, dressed in bombastic ways with unusual quirks. However, this strangeness is meant to be appealing to the reader, as Araki based the designs of the characters in their stands on experimental runways and fashion for musicians, as previously stated. This will become more apparent with the introduction of the characters and their visual motifs.
Jolene, Hermes, Foo Fighters, Weather Report, Anasui, and Emporio form a found family unit, having either lost their family due to murder, suicide, or neglect. In the case of Jolene, for example, Jotaro is an absent father, causing her to have a record as a juvenile delinquent as she lashed out in her youth and had a tendency to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Her visual motif is the thesis of Stone Ocean, an illustration of perishability, a butterfly with a dagger acting as its thorax and abdomen, with the word prey engraved on the cross guard. This is not only the tattoo on her left arm, but the emblem on the chest of her outfit. The butterfly rests on a heart that is surrounded by spider web, depicting a butterfly caught in the web of fate. Jolene's stand ability, stone free, causes her to turn her own flesh into string, unraveling her body. It is a visual metaphor for her life unraveling, the Japanese string of fate that brought her prison family together, the material of a chrysalis from which a butterfly emerges. Everything Jolene represents is the end of a cycle, whether it be a metamorphosis which she undergoes as she dies, the end of the history of neglect in her family and life, or the end of a narrative arc in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Jolene's motif defines the rest of the cast and brings them together. Whether Report has butterfly cutouts in his outfit, Jolene used the strings of Stone Free to assist Hermes when she was going to be assaulted by prison guards, bringing them together. Emporio was saved from death by a swarm of butterflies because of Jolene sacrificing her life to save his. However, the character most defined by Jolene is also the one that is the strongest example of Japanese aesthetics in the characters. Anasui Narciso, as Jolene's androgynous partner, underwent major redesigns. Araki explained, <laughs> Anasui was officially introduced in the 59th chapter of Stone Ocean, aptly named His Name is Anasui. This chapter name did initially cause a shock, as the first design of Anasui had already made its debut in chapter 24, depicting him as a woman. However, Araki was unhappy with it and felt it lacked the same ambiguity that the masculine yet canonically beautiful Hermes Costello had. With Anasui being officially male, his character was further elevated. Regarding the principle of suggestion, there is constant confusion regarding Anasui's gender outside of the text, with discussions online continuing over 20 years after publication, which is exactly what Araki had hoped for. Irregularity, as discussed when introducing the characters, is embraced to its fullest degree. There are, for example, deconstructed shoes in his outfit, a representation of how his stand, Diver Down, can make things incomplete by removing parts or fundamentally altering the way they function, something Anasui has been fascinated with since childhood. His outfit looks incomplete and speaks to his mental state. There is the concept of suggestion present, as Anasui can be interpreted as embodying femininity and masculinity, or not identifying with gender conformity whatsoever through his design alone, posing a take on the blooming branch, Schrodinger's gender. There is even an instance of him giving birth to the standability that is effectively ending the world, albeit through his left arm. Simplicity is entirely rejected with his design, as he is clad in fishnets and wears high heels, detailed down to having pink eyelashes and specific curls to his hair. His fishnets also tie into perishability, as they are linked to Jolene's design and the spiderweb motif that covers her outfit, as well as the string that she turns herself into. Anasui is deeply in love with Jolene, swearing to marry and protect her. He was the first man in her life to unabashedly support and care for her, and it's shown that they are together as lovers in the different timelines. They're tied together by the string of fate. He also literally dies by her hand during the first timeline reset, something made to happen by Pucci's grand design. This string of fate that ties Anasui to Jolene also ties Weather Report to Jolene, interestingly enough. Anasui acts as a foil to Romeo, and Weather Report acts as a foil to Jotaro. The presence of Anasui in Weather Report and the influence Jolene has on their designs showcase how important she is to them and vice versa. Anasui handles the trauma of Jolene's relationships romantically, while Weather Report heals Jolene through being a father figure. Both these men are defined by Jolene, and they help her get over her canonically stated trauma that is caused by men.
Perishability is the principle that truly defines the plot. Outside of it being at the core of the symbolic imagery of the part, it is also ingrained in the concept of gravity, as explained by Pucci when carrying out his false god's plans. Pucci worships Dio, the now deceased former antagonist who had meant to execute a plan to end the current world and bring about a new world and timeline. Gravity, as established in Stotian, is another word for fate, or as Dio explained it to Pucci, the natural pull of the universe that draws people together. Through exploiting this gravity, they wish to accelerate and manipulate the fate of the world, using the standability made in heaven to bring everyone in the world to their fate, as deemed by the gravitational pull of the universe. Once the world ended in a new timeline, everyone was tied to this gravity and aware of their fate, making every person on earth omniscient. Pucci believed this to be heaven, causing the immediate death and rebirth of the planet to bring this to fruition. When this was successfully executed, not only did the entirety of the main cast, save for Emporio, die almost immediately, Jolene had to unravel herself fully, something that she had never done before, using all her flesh in the process. Like the chrysalis analogy mentioned in her character motif, her sacrifice of the flesh acted as a pupa, releasing a swarm of monarch butterflies as she died. Jolene's fate was to perish, as she always was the butterfly caught in gravity's web. She knew her death was inevitable, and thus embraced the transient nature of her life to pursue her fated end. Her death was also the reason that Emporio was able to live and ultimately kill Pucci, resetting the world once more. A butterfly effect world. It was a world in which Pucci was never born, meaning the deaths of Emporio's found family had never come to pass. The final panel of Stone Ocean emphasizes the importance of, well, finality. In the world without Pucci, the main cast was reborn into happy and stable lives, but this was not without the end of their former lives. As the car that transports the reborn main cast drives through the rain, the ghostly images of their past lives hang overhead. It is hauntingly beautiful, and a reminder from Araki that no matter how overzealous Pucci was, there was a basis to the concept of gravity. No matter their fate, no matter the gravity of the universe, all things must come to an end. Araki makes a point by having Pucci be a fanatical priest. In his pursuit of the ultimate form of simplicity, an inoffensive life with constant guarantees lived in the most reserved way as everyone knew of their gravity, he abandoned perishability. The aspiration to create heaven through omniscience and certainty forgets that life needs a regularity and the promise of perishability to be worth living. In his final monologue in the second timeline, he says, For example, five years from now, what could happen? Everyone knows what will happen now. During the accelerated time, they experienced every accident, every illness, when their life would end. They already experienced it before arriving here. When will one meet another, and when will they separate? When will war occur, and when will the world change? Who will one love and hate? What kind of child will one bear, and what kind of person will that child become? Who will commit crimes, and who will invent and create works of beauty? The spirit, not the mind or body, has already experienced and memorized those facts, and that is happiness. Not just one person, but everyone will be able to face their destiny. Ones who are able to face this are the ones who will be happy. You might think that knowing the ill fortunes of the future is despair, but it's the opposite. Even if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, it is that resolution that makes one happy. One's resolution eradicates despair. Humanity will change. This is what is striped for. This is made in heaven. His tirade reveals that he does not find importance in a core premise of life and the Japanese principle that Araki leans into most. In each of these parts, especially Stone Ocean, Araki makes an argument for the beauty of the transient and often fleeting nature of life, having characters die young or live in the throes of uncertainty. It is this uncertainty and the knowledge of an end but not having the knowledge of when it will occur that makes life and relationships meaningful. Jolene's sacrifice was not in vain, as Pucci implies to Emporio through this monologue. She was not resolved to her death, but understood she was to die one day. Her acceptance of perishability and her desire to foster meaning in the ordinary, such as how she connected to her found family, made her the antithesis of Pucci and his desire to live in complete simplicity. When performing this analysis, I found that Pucci's mentality was very reminiscent of Woman in the Dunes, 
1962 Japanese novel and this 1964 film adaptation. A world without irregularity conformed to Japanese work culture and collectivist ideals, something depicted through allegory in Woman in the Dunes with endless banal tasks and the horror of living in such a predictable cycle. Made in Heaven reveals the emptiness of a simple life taken to the extreme, much like how Woman in the Dunes illustrated how confining these ideals of simplicity were. I won't spoil that story too much, but I highly recommend it as a supplemental read or watch alongside part 6 since it encapsulates Puji's plan perfectly, albeit in a different setting. Through Stone Ocean, simplicity is turned into a cosmic horror. Simplicity has been something weaponized by those in power, like Puji, something to live in to have as predictable a life as possible. It is simplicity that truly kills, as it snuffs out spontaneity and suffocates the will. To Iraqi, simplicity is not an aesthetic to preserve. Stoshin is loaded with powerful designs and symbolism that show how dangerous it is to adhere too strongly to one ideology, especially when it rejects something as integral to life as the unknown. Iraqi's work as Stone Ocean is arguably his best, and in my opinion, yeah, <laughs> it is his best. Showing the nuance with which he handles the core Japanese aesthetic principles of his characters, using their arcs and motifs to define the overall story he writes, while subverting expectations and making an argument for his distaste of certain aesthetics.